Elizabeth, you've written this book, AIDS, The Ultimate Challenge. Why do you think it's the ultimate challenge for us? I don't know where to start. See, AIDS to me is a very, very close to my heart. AIDS is something that we all grew up with almost since 1980 when we saw our first AIDS patients. And nobody knew a thing about it. And people, everybody said, oh, it's a gay disease, there's nothing to do with us. And most of the reports did come from San Francisco, from the gay community. But now, eight, nine years later, the picture of AIDS is a totally different picture. And we really have to take a good, hard look at what we are saying and what words we are spreading and what misconception we spread. Everybody talks about AIDS as a fatal illness. Right. It's always terminal. That's not true. And AIDS is not a gay disease. It's a disease of our society, of many societies, but of this world in which we live now. And when you look at the prophecies, whether you, you take Nostradamus or the Hopi Indians, or the, the revelation, it has always been predicted that this will happen before the change of the century, when we finally, finally learn our lessons. So first, I think we have to get rid of the false notion that it's terminal. Then mm. we have to put out of our heads that it's a gay disease. It's an immune system deficiency that can affect anybody and everybody. And it's a lesson how to change our total total lifestyle, everything, how we live, what values we have, what we eat, mm. what uh, we p are preoccupied with. And we are preoccupied with sick issues. And mm. you can see that in the AIDS research. You can see that when you try to start the project. Everybody first asks, how much money? As if it had anything to do with money. It has something to do with your attitude. And not just yours and mine, but the whole population that is affected by it. And I'm going to talk only about America now. I don't mm -hmm. want to get into Africa where it's a big disaster and Europe where they're still behind and Australia and New Zealand where they're just beginning. But I hope that these nations were just beginning with the epidemics. Like Europe, Australia, New Zealand are the ones I know the best. That they at least learn some lessons from us. We are far ahead. We're not ahead with our attitude, but we're far ahead with all the mistakes we made. Mm. And I hope that they don't repeat all those mistakes. You see that when you work with AIDS babies. I mean, it's ridiculous. I have one phone call after the other, all social service agencies, Child Welfare League, a big organization, national organizations, who get lots of funding and money from everywhere. And they're wasting their time now looking for families who can adopt AIDS babies. Mm. It's ridiculous. I have done that for two years. We have 150 families, more than 150 families, who wait, who hope, who pray to adopt an AIDS baby. It would fill their life. They have plenty of love, compassion, understanding. They are not afraid. All they want is to hold and hug and love an AIDS baby, uh, just to convey to them that they are loved, that they are wanted, that they are cuddled, that they have a family where bonding can finally take place. They can't get them. There's a breakdown someplace. There's a, break, there's a lot of breakdowns because all they want, uh, they do not want to give them to private families. They want mm. to keep them in institutions. Mm. Institutions get paid a lot of money. They get a thousand dollars a day for each AIDS baby. They can experiment with them. Ooh. They're called the pincushion babies. They give them bone marrow tests once a week and I hope you know how painful a bone marrow is when you give that to a two-year-old child mm. and they're petrified those children and after a while since they're totally unable to, to develop a natural bonding with one love object mm. maybe two but not more uh, they have nurses around the clock they have nurses aides they have cleaning women they have lots of people coming going but they, no bonding can take mm. place and after a while they just stare into space by the time we see them, usually they're already brain damaged uh, and they can't sit up and they can't stand and they can't play. They, mm. can never, they have never been outside. They don't see grass. They don't see flowers. They've never seen a butterfly. Mm. And we really cheat those babies out of a natural development, even if they had only two or three years of life, even if that was true. They have not 
lived. Mm. They existed in a crib. We had children who were who looked like they're paralyzed, they can't move. The reason was that they were never taken out of the crib. They're totally, their muscles don't develop. Nothing develops. And then when we finally are able to kidnap maybe one child, and give it to a loving, loving, loving couple, and they, they blossom, they bloom like flowers, and it's fantastic. Yeah. You saw Lucy, yeah. my four-year-old, that just went through her right. baptism, and she looked like a queen, and she's beaming, yes. and she's ve like a natural, normal four-year-old child, very brain damaged, very vulnerable, very sick, needs sterile water all the time, needs special formula, needs fantastic loving care, but she is loved, and if mm. she would die tomorrow, her childhood would have been a childhood yeah. full of joy and full of love. These crib babies who are in institutions and hospitals, they get a little pinch in the cheek from somebody who comes by, or they give them a little uh, toy in the crib, but no human interrelationship, and that to me is very tragic. And now they're applying for grants and money for such an adoption project. We have done the same thing mm -hmm. without ever getting a nickel. We, we put an ad in our, uh, in our newsletter, word by mouth, when I talk to Compassionate Friends Organization, of parents who had lost a child in the last few years, I tell them, if you want to love a baby, you have ha gone mm. through the experience of loving somebody and letting go and losing them. Maybe God prepared you to be an expert I'm in loving expert. and knowing that our children are not uh, our, our own. They are temporary loan to us. And if you have learned that, then you can give this love, compassion to a baby mm. of AIDS, who may not live, who may never go to school, and they are willing to adopt, but yeah. we cannot get those babies out. Yeah. And that it just highlights all the tragedies of our society that you think you can only do good by first getting money. You need to get grants, you need to get money. I have done this work for 25 years. Yeah. I've never charged a single patient. I've never applied for a grant. I've never gotten a big donation. And we are functioning, and we are doing our work, and that people have to get through. The only people that are like a shining light to me, and I'm, I think I'm objective, has been the gay community, hmm. the gay man community. They have been ostracized, they have been rejected, they have been labeled, they have been treated like absolutely horrible. And they realize that everywhere they go, medical establishment, funeral directors, dentists, hmm. cab drivers, Oh, no, no, we don't want to take, and they use very horrible names. And they finally knew that they have to pull their own resources. And they organized a mutual support group, which is outstanding. And the best has been in San Francisco, where there are home care projects. There is people who go and massage them, who touch them, who are not afraid of them. Uh, volunteers, uh, people who have time, instead of spending their time playing bridge, they go and do the laundry for an AIDS patient. Mm. And that takes love and not fear. And I think the biggest lesson we have to learn in this epidemic is what has been predicted in all the prophecies. <coughs> it's supposed to be a, a, to mobilize or to, to be a catalyst for the separation of the wheat from the chaff. Mm. If you base your choices on fear, you're going to be destroyed because your immune system, your own immune system, is going to be affected by it. And if you're petrified and if you think you have to hold your breath when you drive by my farm because there may be a virus in the air of Elizabeth's farm, uh, you're going to be so petrified that you're going to get sick. And then you're vulnerable and then your immune system goes down. And then I want to see how these people react. Then they'll hmm. blame it on somebody, on us naturally. Uh, if you are full of love and base all your choices every single day on love, unconditional love, not I love you, you do this and that for me, uh, then you'll have so much energy, you'll grow in compassion, you will, will grow in understanding, and then you end up what we ended up the day before the big Washington DC conference. Hmm. I really needed something to put together what I want to tell these hmm. people in a very short time. And when I need help, and when your spiritual quadrant is open, you know that all you have to do is ask. And if you need it, you get it, right? Mm. 
Hmm. If you only want it, you may not get it. So it's a wonderful differential <laughs> diagnosis. When I finally I sat in my chair and I said, I really need some compact, something to know what to present in a short time. <clears throat> then I took a break and went back to my mail and answered my endless mail, quarter of a million pieces of mail, and it comes out of my ear and I really dislike it and I have a tendency <laughs> to become very negative because every night I have to take that meal till three in the morning. And I was supposed to be in a good state right the next day. So I said, I'm just going to open one more envelope, not tens or a hundred. And I opened this envelope and in that envelope, mm, the answer yeah. to my <laughs> prayers, a book beyond AIDS by two guys who had AIDS, who had Kaposi sarcoma, who had this horrible pneumonia, who had <laughs> all the symptoms. And they did what 99% of all my patients do. They went from doctor to doctor, from clinic to clinic. Everybody, either implicit or explicitly, told them that there is nothing we can do for you. Meaning they took all their hope away. Yeah. If you, I've said that 25 years ago, if you take hope away from a cancer patient, they're not gonna make it. Mm -hmm. So they have no hope, they have nothing in the established in establishment that gives them any chance so they started to search. One was head trip, was very intellectually hypertrophic. He didn't believe anything psychic or spiritual or all that. So what does he get? He finds a book written by a doctor. Well, that immediately becomes acceptable to somebody who is intellectually hypertrophic. If he's a doctor, he must have brains and he must be right. <laughs> so he studies <laughs> Symington's books, right? And visualization and all the things that I've used with my cancer patients. And his spiritual friend, who is okay intellectually, but he has much more trust in spiritual uh, issues, said, you know, there's something wrong with you. You're so angry at your age. You hate your Kaposi sarcoma. If you have any negativity left, hate, anger, resentment, you're not able to heal yourself. You have to love it. Now, how can you love a Kaposi sarcoma? I mean, it looks ugly, icky, horrible and it spreads, and you feel like you're a leprosy patient. But this man loved his friend, and he listened to him, and unbeknown to him, <coughs> he sends love to this Kaposi sarcoma. And then he also told him, you have to stroke it, you have to be nice with it, even if you resent it for a while, after a while you may get to, to like your Kaposi sarcoma. So unbeknown to his friend, he starts to stroke it, he sends love, light, everything he can imagine that's positive. And this Kaposi sarcoma gets lighter and lighter and begins to disappear. And he needed that to see that there is something to love, to, to just getting rid of negativity. The other friend, I don't want to tell the whole story of the book, the other friend looked through other means, more alternative kind of uh, things meditation, visualization, healthier food, no more cigarettes, all the stuff I'm in the process of learning, and it's <laughs> difficult <laughs> as hell. And the end result was that both of them got healed. Mm. And then there was this other woman, Nero, who had AIDS from her husband, who also didn't buy these negative predictions, and she got healed. My two AIDS babies, we have 3,000 babies with AIDS in this country, mm. Two of my AIDS babies were born with AIDS, had all the symptoms of AIDS, were verified with AIDS. And after a year, they both became negative and are well now. Mm. Why, so why don't we hear about these things? Because, you see, this would be a slap on the wrist of the medical establishment. If somebody would come and say, you can heal AIDS with love, they would think you flipped or you must be a Californian <laughs> or you're flaky. But for a scientist, a physician, mm. to say you can, love such a you can love such a dreadful disease and heal yourself, that is not acceptable. Besides, the pharma pharmaceutical industries and all the people have lots of millions invested in this AIDS. If you would go around and say, all you need to do, and I'm not saying that it's easy, I can tell you it's hard as can be, it's the hardest thing you've ever done in your, in your entire life. You have to not only love others or love the ones who have been nice to you, you have to love yourself. And to love yourself 
is a tough lesson to learn when you especially have been raised that you're no good, that you're a pervert, you're a, what do they call it, a fuck it? All sorts of things and you've been raised this way. So you have no self-esteem, you have no self-worth, you have never been good for anything. And now suddenly somebody comes and says you have to love yourself. You have to forgive your parents for having treated you so shabby. You have to forgive those people who refused in the old days to bury your friends. They couldn't find a funeral home. You have to forgive the dentist who refuses to fix your teeth when you're going crazy with toothache. You have to learn to love and to forgive. And if you can learn that, and it's a very slow motion process, if you can truly learn that, you can become whole. And this is basically what we taught in our workshops for 15, 20 years is to get in touch with all your unnatural emotion, hate, resentment, greed, uh, all the negativity, the, the grief work, the, the lack of self-worth. And if you can get rid of that and become natural again, then you're whole. And whole means that you finally open up your spiritual quadrant. When your physical, emotional, intellectual, and spiritual quadrant are all like one quarter of a pie, and are in balance with each other, then you start to live in balance with Mother Nature. And as you heal yourself, you also heal planet Earth. And if you heal yourself, then you can become a healer. Then you can help other people. But you cannot help other people if you are full of self-hate, full of resentment, full of negativity. We have been teaching that for <coughs> 15, 20 years. Now for the first time, and that is with this book, Beyond yeah. AIDS, it just clicked. It all fell together like a hundred pieces of a puzzle. I said, if we can teach that from kindergarten on, before kindergarten, when we raise children and we teach them how to become natural and in harmony, they never have to get sick. They may still have some broken bones. Maybe an appendix will still rupture, maybe still a little food for medicine, but not much because they will not choose to have surgery that is not necessary. They will not choose all the things that we do to them, which is an insult to the body and to the natural balance. And so if we can teach, we can learn that, the beauty is we can learn that from our AIDS patients who have healed themselves. If we can learn that from them, if we can organize an army of people who have learned to practice that, and really feel that way, not just phony baloney. Then we can raise a next generation, and that is what the next generation is going to be like. We're going to concentrate all our efforts on staying well mm. and on preventive medicine <coughs> instead of filling them up with toxic stuff and antibiotics each time they have a sneeze and a sniffle. And then when they really need an antibiotic, they're immune to it. What? Uh why, why has it taken this type of a large-scale, catastrophic disease to create an environment for learning? Historically seen, uh, the world has always been hit by epidemics, hmm. by sicknesses, by TB in my childhood days, tuberculosis was a horrible thing. and. There were big sanatoriums all over Switzerland where you had to lie flat and be good and lie on a balcony for two, three years with tuberculosis because we didn't have anything for TB yet. Were all those diseases considered hopeless? In those days, they were very, very difficult. Hmm. Once you got TB all over, there was no chance that you would make it. And we had wars all over the place. I remember, and I'm an old bag, uh, the, the <laughs> World War, you know, in the World War, it, it was a horrible war. We didn't learn a lesson about it, about living in peace with our fellow men. Then came Korea, Vietnam, I don't have to mention Vietnam, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, we think if we drop an atom bomb, hmm. peace will prevail. It has never prevailed. We had like 59 wars at any one time in the last hmm. few years in the world. Then come the children of Biafra and Hunger, and, and drought, and one tragedy after the other, and we don't learn because our attitude, and I'm again talking about America, you see pictures on TV with children with bloaty bellies, mm. they're starving to death and their arms are like my thumb. 
we send maybe $50 or $100 and we feel like big shots. Mm. Then we switch the TV off and we go to a banquet at the country club. And you know how much food is thrown away in America on airplanes mm. alone? Yeah. Mm. I'm a smoker. I sit in the back of the airplane in the good days when smoking was still allowed in the back of the airplane. And you could, they carry trays out and throw them out, you could feed an army. We waste money and we think with money you can solve the problem and put it out of your mind. You send a check to Biafra that's starving children and you've taken care of it. And then you go and indulge and, and you make a picky of yourself and you don't even acknowledge that America has hungry people has homeless people, have people who don't know what to put on the table, <coughs> and don't learn. So now comes this epidemic, this AIDS. It's no longer just on TV in Africa, you see. AIDS is here, is here to stay for a while. AIDS affects men, women, children, black, white, Mexican, every race, every creed, every color. And suddenly, you have to have an opinion. I mean, you have to do something about it. But people don't want to know about it. It is not my business. This does not have nothing to do with me. But what affects the least of us affects us and the whole society. Mm -hmm. So what people need to learn is that we are literally each other's keeper. And if mm -hmm. you suffer, or if you're hungry, or if you don't have a home, or if you're sick, then I have to do something about it. Doesn't mean I have to feed the whole world, but at least I should do, I should deplete all my own resources to make your life more bearable and your life more bearable. And we've not learned that lesson. So AIDS to me, if we didn't learn with the wars, we didn't learn with the famine, we didn't learn with the horrible earthquakes all over the world, now we get something that will affect every one of us. Mm. And there will be AIDS in every single community, in every one of them. And your chance, and I have to call it a chance, is how you respond to it. Are you going to do his laundry? Are you going to change his bed sheets when he soils and he can no longer be continent? Are you going to cook a meal and feed him when he can no longer lift a spoon? <coughs> or you can label them. You can say, well, he's so and so, he deserves it, and just ignore them. Mm. Until it happens in your own family. And maybe that eye opener is needed for a lot of people before they can finally see the light. Well, so many people feel utterly hopeless because it's said on TV in every place that it is fatal <coughs> and there is no cure. But yet, more and more books are coming out saying that there is hope and that there is a cure. <coughs> if you look for a medical model, there is no cure. That is true. Oh, all right. Okay, for a medical model. Difference. See, we're used. We have to find a um, vaccine or something. That we don't have. But we have to learn that there are other means of healing. Mm -hmm. And they have to come from within. The old shamans have known this all the time. The kahunas uh -huh. in Hawaii, the Indian shamans, the aboriginal shamans, all the so-called all so-called primitive cultures have always known that. We have, with our arrogance, with our belief that science and has money all the answers. has all the answers, maybe we have to learn humility. Mm -hmm. Maybe we have to learn that money cannot buy everything. And science then does not have all the answers. Until we open up our spiritual quadrant and see that there are other dimensions and other realities that we don't even acknowledge. But yeah. they're there. And once you acknowledge that and you begin to know that you are responsible mm. for not only your health, your well-being, but to stay in harmony between your physical, emotional, intellectual, and spiritual quadrant. And if you can do that, then your spiritual quadrant opens up like a flower. And then you get in touch with those other realities. Mm -hmm. Then you begin to visualize. You can use meditation. You can use nutrition. You can use all sorts of things 
then you will get well. You will get better. We have 115 patients so far that have healed themselves. Where? In the United States. Oh. And that is a very conservative number. That's I the think number so. But that's the number that the Communicable Disease Center acknowledged. Oh. So you know it's ten times bigger. It has always been. So there is hope, but you have to really convey to people. To learn that lesson, you have to let go of everything that you knew and start from scratch. And it's very, very difficult. I, I can l talk from my own experience. All I try to do is let go of my cigarettes, and it's the hardest thing in the world I've ever had to do. Yeah. And it's difficult. Yeah. And if people tell me I have to eat like a vegetarian, <laughs> not that I like meat, but I resent to have to, to be a vegetarian. I can't stand people who brag being <laughs> vegetarians. Do you understand that? I and I have to get in touch, where does that come from? But yes. why, why does that bother me? really bothers me. I cook a good meal. Oh, I can't touch that. I can't eat that. And I love to cook. Mm -hmm. And I love to feed people. <laughs> and they're big fuss pots. And very proud of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's, it, it's a multidimensional approach. Mm -hmm. Like AIDS is a multidimensional illness. It's not an illness caused by a virus. Right. The big problem is Oh, everything, our environment, the polluted air, the polluted food, the polluted soil, the polluted water, everything has contributed to a miserable declining immune system. Not only of all of us, but of Mother Earth. Mother Earth is terminally ill. Mm -hmm. And as if we learn to heal ourselves, and live a clean life, clean on many levels, mm -hmm. then Mother Earth can heal. But we have to do it before it's too late. Mm. And that is what the new age is all about. Mm -hmm. That is going from an age of materialism mm -hmm. and arrogance to an age of pure spirituality. Mm. And that is not an easy task, but it can be done. Where can people who are looking for help go? Where can they write or find out? I know George and Will were going around the country talking. They should read that book, Beyond AIDS, right? right. Well, well, and they should call AIDS <laughs> organizations and ask the patients. You see, the patients have always been my best teachers. Ask the patients, can you name me a handful of physicians who are open to alternative means. Meditation, read Symington's books. Um, I don't like meditation. I can't sit still and fold it up and uh, <laughs> stare into space. It's terribly not my cup of tea. And I would ask around, if you're not a meditator, what can you do? <laughs> and you will get lots of ideas and you have to try them out. Because what may help you is not my cup of tea, it may not mm -hmm. help me. Uh, he would be great with uh, vegetarian food and meditation. I couldn't stand it. I would become so negative, I would make myself more sick. <laughs> so everybody has to find their own avenues and their own ways. There is not one answer. But you cook your own meal. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. I mean, that right. the purely symbolic. It's individual. Yeah. I would go in the forest, I would climb a mountain every day. That's what I did after my stroke. Mm. After two and a half days in the hospital, I was paralyzed on my right side and I couldn't speak. And I knew if I stay in this hospital, I will die. I will not make it. They woke me up every hour around the clock for two nights and two days with a flashlight in my eyes. I said, could you make some music when you come in? So waking up is a little bit more chant. No, we can't do that. I said, I send you a Swiss musical box. <laughs> Just play the musical box so I know it's time to wake up again. We can't do that. I said, can you whistle? No, I can't whistle. And the tone, you know, is horrible. I signed myself out. I came home to my farm. I hiked the mountain every day on top and down. In no time, in two, three days, I was back my old peppy yeah. self. But that's not for everybody. Do you understand? Right. You have to know, to me, mountain climbing 
and fresh air and in the summer not sleep in in the garden. That would heal me, would make me well. Right. Probably there are going to be a lot of changes in the world today with people really looking to take responsibility. More vegetarian restaurants. Probably <laughs> so. Living foods. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Has there been any interest from the traditional medical community now that books like Beyond <coughs> AIDS and things like this are, are becoming more prominent? We they, have, they can't ignore it forever. We have had only two weeks since this book is on the market and we reached several thousand people at the conference. But even uh, at the university, you know, where I'm on the faculty, uh, they are very open, very open. They are sending a busload of students out here to my farm so I can teach them about all these things. Mm. That would have been unheard of 10 years ago. Mm. They are open to meditation. I could not teach them meditation, but I can tell them this is what helps some people. They are into, uh, they, they accept people who use acupuncture, acupressure, uh, health food, all sorts of holistic approaches. And the nice thing is you don't have to be a Californian to do that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you can actually <coughs> learn but what is good for you and share it as long as you don't have to impose it on your fellow man. So the key is... Uh, unconditional love. Unconditional love. Yeah. If I can tolerate your vegetarian food and fishing stuff out of my lunch plate because it doesn't <laughs> fit you, and I'm not getting mad at you, but uh, that's your cup of tea. This kind of food is my cup of tea and can accept you without judging you and labeling you. Mm -hmm. Then I have grown, then I have made a step forward. We have to learn that not only with AIDS, we have to learn that from nation to nation, from neighborhood to neighborhood, until the world begins to understand that we are one family. One, I wanted to say, one world instead of many nations. Mm -hmm. It has to, to expand and has a ripple effect much bigger than you can ever imagine. My favorite book is The Hundreds Monkey. Hmm. You know, it starts with one, then two, then three, then four. And when a certain number of human beings have learned to live this way, at one critical point takes a certain mass leap mathematical number or mass, then all of <coughs> mankind this collective consciousness. Will, will do that. Mm -hmm. And that's the point. I want to live long enough until that happens. Mm, okay. Elizabeth, George and Will were so thrilled to meet you. It was, it was mutual. Oh, you know, uh, I don't think you realize the encouragement and the hope that you have given to, I would say, millions of people around the world. And I think we're on a new wave. The encouragement that you gave to these boys to then go out again on their trip around the country, who are then going to encourage the others who are looking for healing in their lives, is monumental. We have to get through to people that nobody can live without hope. Mm -hmm. My cancer patients, when the doctor told them there's nothing else you can do, they died. Uh, hope does not mean cure, treatment, or prolongation of life. Hmm. That is true at the beginning of a serious illness, like cancer, multiple sclerosis, or ALS, or AIDS, or whatever. But at the end, when their spiritual quadrant begins to open up, their hope changes to a totally different quality of hope. One of my mm -hmm. black patients who in the days where uh, kidney transplants were a fortune and she couldn't afford it, was turned down for a kidney transplant because she didn't have any money. Mm -hmm. She could have lived another 20 years, but she was poor and she was a cleaning woman and she had no chance. In those days, those values played an important role. And one day she said, you know, Dr. Ross, I just hope that God will accept me in his garden. Mm. And I naturally fed into that hope and I said, he does not discriminate. A black cleaning woman <laughs> is as important as a big medical director of a big medical school. There are no discrimination. It's all pure love. And she was beaming. 
And she, all she talked is about her garden. No. And I'm a gardener, and I could really share that hope with her. And she died, but she died with a smile, with mm. peace, with loving acceptance. This is my destiny. I was yeah. born black, I was black, born poor. And in our society, we have no money for a kidney transplant for people like us. She had no resentment, no negativity. And those were my teachers in the old days. Yeah. And the same thing is true now. If, you, if all the news media, everybody says, oh, with AIDS, you're going to die. Yeah. Like you have two years to live. You plant that seed, it's hopeless. And from hopelessness, you cannot learn to love yourself. Then comes the guilt, the shame, the resentment, the frustration, the negativity, and you cannot get well. This so, really needs to be reversed, doesn't it? Yes, but yeah. we have to start different. We have to start a whole new generation mm -hmm. to learn that love is the priority number one. And all the other things you work on, you get rid of your guilt, you confess when you feel guilty, whether it's real or imagined, doesn't matter. If you really uh, share your things that you're guilty about, if it's genuine, not just from your head, it's followed by a flood of tears. And if you're loved and accepted and not judged, not criticized, then you learn to forgive yourself. And the moment we forgive ourselves, we are forgiven. And you have to teach that, you have to learn that. <coughs> the other thing, it took me 62 years to learn, and I want to put that in. <laughs> I always, you know, I always heard thy will, not my will. Mm -hmm. I mean, that I have no problem with. I know he knows a lot more than I do. But I want it at my time, and I want it right now. And I, I was very <laughs> impatient for many, many years. And I was pushy, and I wanted people to work and get things done. And finally it dawned on me what they never teach us, from kindergarten on, is that thy time, not my time. There is a right time and the right moment for everything. And that nobody teaches. So mm -hmm. I think they should teach that. We push each other. Yeah, we the, push you know, our kids. Uh, uh, what's re what I'm ready for, you may not be ready for. Mm -hmm. Somebody would have told me five years ago I have to stop smoking. I said, <laughs> I'm not ready for that. Yeah. I still have a hard time, but I'm getting closer to it. Yeah. But so everybody has their own timetable and their own schedule. Right. And um, if it's not right for you, it's not right. Yeah. Then so there is this judge. bigger timetable that we have absolutely... I always said if people could only view their life from a, a few miles mm -hmm. distance. You know, like the first man on the moon. Mm. He saw planet Earth and he was inspired to read, to write that song, The Moon Riders. Mm -hmm. And it describes how he saw planet Earth, there were no more borders. No more borders. No more borders. It was home. Planet Earth was home. And in his plea to mankind is view your world from this perspective and then stop destroying it. And we have to start here and then family, and then next of kin, and then neighbors, and then our community, and then not just our country, it will be a ripple effect all over the world. And then we start, what do they call that, the golden age or something? Mm -hmm. The new age. And that's what, uh, what's going to be for our children and children's children, and I can't wait for it. Good. <laughs> I just wait for my own grandchildren to be born now. What's the, so lucky. Uh, <laughs> what's the most uh, important <coughs> thing that individual people can do that, do that are really, really afraid, sincerely afraid? You have to become honest again, because grown-ups are not honest. They're all phony balonies, more or less, everybody. You have to be much, much more honest. Not just with the world around you, that comes secondarily. You have to be honest with yourself. If you feel resentful, if you push my button, if I'm a real sourpuss today, instead of contaminating my whole environment, I should take a good, honest, hard look at myself and say, what pushed my buttons that I'm reacting this way? And then get rid of that in your privacy of your own place before you hit your children and beat the dog and, and make everybody unhappy around you. And then, step by step, you need to know that any time, any time you react negative,
to anybody or anything. If your reaction is more than 15 seconds, it's your own trip. <laughs> so if you react more than 15 seconds to anything or anybody, take a good, hard, honest look at yourself and get rid of it because it's your unfinished business. And if you can learn day by day, every day, and if you make a choice, and you make a thousand choices every day, uh, if you make a choice and you don't know whether you should do this or that, always try, at least try, to take the highest choice possible. Mm. You cannot go wrong. But see if you learn that when you're three years old, and you don't have to wait till you're 60, it's much easier because children are so honest, so beautiful, so gorgeous, they're no phony baloney. But we contaminate them. By the time they go to school, they're already contaminated. They're mm -hmm. already full of negativity, full of unfinished business. Mm -hmm. We have to start education from children. In the meantime, we have to help our grown-ups. Mm -hmm. That's you know where they come to my workshops and they learn how to get in touch with their unfinished business and especially how to become honest again, not phony baloney. Can that can that be done with children? As oh well as yeah. Adults? Oh, children work. Oh, children workshops. It takes one day for a group of children to learn that. Hmm. What takes me and my staff five days with grown-ups? It's a forceps delivery. With <laughs> children, oh, it's just beautiful. We put the telephone pole horizontally, give each one a child-sized rubber hose, and we them get going, get your anger out, get your Hitler out, so you can become a Mother Teresa. And they can't wait. And then they go and beat that telephone pole and say, I'm going to kill every grown-up. And then in a second, they turn around and say, except you and so and so. Mm -hmm. So when they're through this, I said, why did you make an exception of two people? Well, somebody has to feed me. <laughs> I mean, they are so mm -hmm. simple and honest. And this is what I understand, you know, where it says in the Bible, we have to become like children mm -hmm. again. This is what means you have to become like children again. You, Get you, rid of the crap, of the baloney. The beauty about working with dying patients, and that's why I survived three decades, is dying patients, uh, you know, first they were big shots, they are uh, the assistant to the mayor, and they are the president of PTA, and they are everywhere, in every committee, and the higher up they are, the better. When they are full of cancer, for example, uh, they begin to drop off all these committee meetings and all this stuff. And then at the end, they don't want to see business associates anymore. Then they want to see their children one more time, and maybe their relatives the last time. And at the end, they pick one or two people who are comfortable, no show business, mm -hmm. no big phrases, no big, oh, if you just eat your chicken noodle soup, you're going to get well. They know that they are close to death and they've accepted it. And so your world of interest becomes smaller and smaller and investment gets smaller and smaller. And that's when many thousands of people begin to look inside. And that's when at the end of their life they begin to open their spiritual quadrant. And then they suddenly are aware of their guidance. They are aware of what some people call guardian angels or guides or whatever you call them. They're aware that they have never been alone. Never, ever, ever. And they have dialogues, and then somebody writes in the chart, patient begins to hallucinate. And they just smile. They know that this nurse is not there yet. She thinks this is hallucination, when in reality, they're already aware of a mother who died three years earlier, and she's coming now and gives her a preparation for the transition we call death. But you have to go through the tumbler of life a thousand times until you get in touch with that. And I always said when life puts you through a tumbler, you have a choice to get come out crashed or polished. And if you come out polished, life puts you through another tumbler until you're a diamond. Mm. And that's why my patients are diamonds, because they have gone through a hell of a life sometimes. Or my patients who have suffered for years with AIDS rejected, spit that uh, horrible treatment, and they have survived, but they came out stronger because of it. Mm -hmm. I not wish uh, people have to go through these windstorms of life. Unfortunately, we don't learn when things are easy and well. So sometimes I even say to a patient, you know, you wouldn't be pushed through the tumbler of life if it wasn't for a purpose.
Mm. And all parents who have lost a child, I've worked with a lot of parents whose children were murdered. They think they never have another day of happiness in their life. Later on, they become members of a parent group of parents mm. of murdered children. And they touch thousands of lives only because they have gone through and they know what it's like. So you have to see that these things do not happen as a punishment from God. There are still thousands of fundamentalists in this country who say this is a punishment from God. This is not the punishment from God. The only way we can finally learn humility, compassion, love, understanding, is through tragedies. We have not learned it any other way. We had thousands of years of our chances and we have not taken it. So now comes something that really is going to affect everybody. And you have to take a stand. And when I call my I book... I think that's what you meant when you said uh, yeah, it's AIDS, the, the ultimate, ultimate challenge. challenge. To me, it's like the last chance of mankind to learn the lessons of love. If you base your choices on fear, it's going to destroy you, ultimately. Or you get rid of your fears and learn what love is all about. Not love to go to bed with somebody. Not love, I love you if you buy me a mink coat, because that's not love. But love without hooks, without strings attached to it, without ifs. If you would raise one generation of children who never hear the word if, I love you if you bring mm. good grades home, I love you if you make it through high school, God would I love you if I could say my son the doctor, you raise a generation of prostitutes. Mm. They learn that if they do things to please you, then they're getting what they want. Mm -hmm. And that's not love. They don't learn love anymore. Old people, grandmas and grandpas, and toddlers, they are one of the few people that can teach and give each other what they need and what they have been cheated of. Mm. If you make ET centers, elderly and toddlers together and skip a generation, the working generation, and put the toddler into a grandma's lap, in an old age home, for example, that child will learn what unconditional love is from that old man or that old woman. And the grandma and the grandpa gets touched again, and they, they, they mm. touch, they love their wrinkles. They even like pimples because they play piano on them. <laughs> And the old people get physically touched and hugged again mm -hmm. and kissed and smooched from the toddlers. It's so, sim it's so simple. Everybody needs love. Old people are not touched and loved and hugged anymore. And children need to start life very young to have one example of unconditional love and it does not have to be mom and dad. Because for parents it's very hard to love your children unconditionally. You expect them to clean up the room, you expect them to do mm. this and that. So they never get that example. If you get old people and young together, it's wonderful. I want to give this uh, favorite example of mine, why AIDS and its implication can be such a challenge mm. to really starting people to live. Uh, in the old days, well, it's three and a half years now, four years when I wanted to adopt AIDS babies. I put it in my newsletter. And the newsletter goes to 25,000 people or so. And I never know where they end up. But one of these newsletters came to British Columbia. There was an old woman living in an attic all by herself. No relatives, no money, very poor. And she had never ventured outside or done anything with her life. She was literally waiting to die. No purpose in life, no nothing, no meaning. And somebody put this newsletter on her doorstep, so I don't know how she found it. And she read about the AIDS babies. And that letter she wrote, I should frame it in a gold mm. frame. She wrote that she finally decided she has to do something about it. So she gets all dressed up. She puts a hat on, a coat, shoes. She gets dressed. And she walks downstairs and walks down the road and walks by a flea market. And she sees that there are dolls for sale on that flea market. Very cheap dolls, naked dolls, discarded by children who have too many toys anyway. And she had her earthly possession was $2.50. So the guy sold her all the five dolls for $2.50. So she gives away everything she owned, you understand. She goes home with these dolls, all excited, goes through the drawers, finds a piece of cloth, a piece of material, 
gets her old sewing machine out and makes dresses and outfits for those dolls. And she is the proudest person in the world because she has a purpose and it's helping somebody and she can really dress them up fancy. She's too poor, she has no boxes, no mailing material, so she takes an old bed sheet. That bed sheet is, I think, my most treasured possession mm. in this house. This old bed sheet, she puts the dolls in that old bed sheet and sews it up and writes on the linen my name and address, hoping that it would get here. And it got here unbroken. Mm. I mean, like somebody carried it on their hands. Mm. And she said, now I have a purpose in my life. I'm going to collect dolls from anywhere I can find them. And I'm going to dress them up for your AIDS babies. Mm. And her life started. See, you don't have to be rich. You don't have to be smart. You don't have to have a doctor degree. All you have to have is heart. If you have a heart, you will invent something that you can do for somebody. And it doesn't matter who it is, basically. There are more needy people in the world. There are more hungry people in the world. There are more people in the world who lie in their BM and nobody's willing to wash their bed sheets. So you can go to these homes, cook for them, wash up, clean up, do anything you want. And you have touched the human life and given them hope again. Not only hope, and I want to emphasize that, not just hope for healing and cure, but hope that somebody cares. Mm. That there are human beings who are not petrified, who don't regard them as of Satan and all that nonsense, but who love you because you're a human being and they want to help you. And what you saw, you reap, needless, this old mm -hmm. woman, she is a peppy advocate now of AIDS babies. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. And, and there are a million things we can do. That's, uh, that's something that individual people can do yes. that are by themselves relatively powerless. Yeah. What can the most powerful group of people in our country do? The media. You see, I'm a strong believer that it starts with individuals. If I can touch an individual who happens to work for the media hmm. and can really touch them, here, not here. Mm -hmm. They will run into somebody that I just talked about. Maybe a neighbor. They heard that they have AIDS. And this person goes to that person and says, mm -hmm. is there anything I can do for you? And the person barely believes that this elegant lady, well-known TV personality wants to do something for me. And he may even test her. Maybe he lies in his PM. Maybe he hasn't had a cooked meal. And he says, well, I'm too weak to lift a cup of coffee. I'm too weak to do that. Almost anything you do will help me. But what helps me the most, perhaps, is if you just sit next to me for a little while and touch me. And this woman says, oh, I do anything but touch you. You know, you're full mm. of Kaposi sarcoma. And then she has to overcome her fears to touch such an ugly hand. And she touches you, and something happens inside of her. That's all it takes. It takes one individual human being to touch you at the right spot, and then it will come in the news media. Don't start on top. Always start at the bottom. The news media can collect cases of people who have healed themselves. Mm. The news media could share a positive story like this old woman in British Columbia. The news media could talk about my two babies who are well now and negative. He has never been in the news media. Never. People don't know unless they heard one of my lectures. Yeah. But there are lots of things that they could share to at least convey to them. It may be terminal yet, if you only look at the medical scientific model. But there are other models, as there are other solar systems and other universes. We are not the only one. And if they can just get through that we know so little, just because we think the medical model is the only answer, I'm always mm. reminded when they said the Earth is flat, 
Hmm. And, and people were, you know, told they're crazy, and now everybody knows it's round. The same thing with Semmel, what was his name, Semmel Blatt, who said when you deliver babies, you have to wash your hand because you are killing these moms. And he was destroyed. He died a broken, destroyed mm. man. And a few years after his death, they found out, the culprit, and found out, yes, he was indeed right. If you wash your hands, the mothers don't die anymore. Mm. There always have been forerunners in medicine, in science, in astrology, everywhere. And they were lynched, and they were uh, criticized, and they were destroyed. And then a few years later, people found out that they were right. You have to stick your neck out and move forward. And your other choice is you say nothing, do nothing, and then you are nothing. And that is your choice. We have to make those choices. To order additional copies of this videotape and for information on the work of Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, contact the Elizabeth Kubler-Ross Center, South Route 616, Headwaters, Virginia, 24442 or telephone the center at area code 703-396-3441. To order the book Beyond AIDS, A Journey into Healing, contact The Quest Bookshop, 619 Main Street, Charlottesville, Virginia, 22901, or call area code 804-295-3377. Information on seminars by George Melton and Will Garcia is available from Brotherhood Press, 279 South Beverly Drive, Suite 185, Beverly Hills, California, 90212, or telephone the Brotherhood Press at area code 213-395-5667.